Hi, my name is Diana. I'm a tour guide at the Chester BD. Today it is my pleasure to introduce you to three tales inscribed on beautifully illustrated hand scrolls in our collection, the tales of Tawara Toda, Oyema, and Miraiki. They are representative of Japanese illustrated storybooks and scrolls known as Nara Ehan, produced by often anonymous artisans during the Edo period. Hand calligraphed using ink on paper and lavishly illustrated with brightly colored paintings, Nara Ehon displayed traditional conventions of representation, such as stylized clouds to frame scenes and missing roofs, enabling the reader to look into buildings to view the action inside. The medium of the hand scroll cultivates a sense of excitement in the reader as scene after scene unfolds, analogous to the progression in a film strip. These three lavishly decorated manuscripts recount adventures of famous Japanese warriors who actually lived during Japan's late classical and early medieval eras, a time that was characterized by the rise of powerful military clans. All three heroes, Hidesato, Laiko, and Yoshitsune, were celebrated in popular ballads and folklore for their valor, strength, and agility. So it is not surprising that over the course of centuries, the lives of these heroes were embellished with fantastic achievements, such as encounters with and defeat of supernatural forces. The first tale relates how Fujiwara no Hidesato, a distinguished member of Emperor Suzaku's court in 10th century Kyoto, acquired the nickname Tawara Toda, or My Lord of the Rice Bag. Grateful for his loyalty, the emperor appointed Hidesato governor of Shimosuke province. Setting out for Shimosuke, Hidesato reached Zeta Bridge, across which, as we can see in the painting, a dragon was sprawled. Although his companions fled, Hidesato calmly stepped over the dragon and continued on his way to spend the night at a local inn. There he was visited by a mysterious woman who announced that she had assumed the form of a dragon to test Hidesato's courage, which was not found wanting, and she urged the hero to slay a giant centipede that was terrorizing her kingdom, that of the Dragon King, situated under Lake Biwa, to which Hidesato readily agreed. As he hastened to Mount Mikami to encounter the monster, the ground shook and the sky thundered at the beast's approach. Note the almost human face of the gigantic centipede painted on our scroll. Hidesato strung his bow, but his first arrow glanced off the centipede's scales, so too did the second. Taking up his third and last arrow, Hidesato spat on its point and said a prayer. This arrow pierced the centipede's massive head and slew the beast. The dragon lady returned to Hidesato and rewarded him with three gifts. A bag of rice that would never run out, a bolt of cloth that would never end, and a cooking pot in which any meal he desired would magically appear ready to eat. We could all do with one of these. She then brought Hideta Sato to her underwater kingdom, where the dragon king also rewarded him with golden armor and a bronze bell, which Hide Sato would donate to Mi Temple in his home province. The remaining Tawara Toda scrolls recount a later adventure. From his new province in eastern Japan, Hide Sato learned that a rebel leader, Masakado of the Taira clan, planned on seizing control of the country. Hidesato set out to visit the rebel and was astonished when Masakado, unkempt and still in bed clothes, received him. When Masakado dropped rice onto his clothes as they ate, this convinced Hidesato that he was unfit to rule. So Hidesato raced to Kyoto to expose the plot to the emperor. Here you can see the emperor ordering Hidesato to set out. A large army would follow to engage the rebel. En route to Masakado's estate, Hidesato stopped at Mi Temple to pray for success to Shindra Daiminyojin, god of the warriors. The imperial army struggled to defeat Masakado, as he was protected by a suit of magical armor and surrounded by six supernatural body doubles. On realizing these difficulties, Hidesato sought a second audience with Masakado, where, posing as his friend, Hidesato announced that he wished to join the rebellion. As you can see from the painting, this time, Masakado received him properly attired. As Hidesato is a famous warrior and member of one of the most powerful families in Japan, 
This ploy succeeded, and he was invited to remain at the castle as Masaka Do's guest. There, Hidei Sato saw a beautiful woman who soon became his lover. After seeing a group of men in her room one night, Hidei Sato asked for an explanation. They were Masakado and his body doubles, she advised. The apparitions were distinguishable from the real Masakado, who alone cast a shadow. Moreover, she revealed Masakado's weakness. His magical armor did not cover all of his face. Armed with this knowledge, Hidei Sato stealthily lay in wait for his host. Observing the seven figures, he took aim with his bow and arrow at the one casting a shadow. The arrow, striking Masakado's vulnerable temple, killed him, whereupon the six body doubles vanished. Hurrah! The threat to the emperor was ended. Our second hero is Minamoto no Yorimitsu, also called Laiko, whose clan, the Minamoto, came to be among the most powerful in the land. Laiko lived from 948 to 1041 CE, during the reign of Emperor Ichijo, when, according to this tale, beautiful young women were mysteriously disappearing from Kyoto. After Lord Ikeda uh, Kunikata's daughter vanished, a diviner was consulted who revealed that she was alive but being held prisoner by demons. When it was discovered that the demons lived on Mount Oyema, northwest of Kyoto, the emperor ordered valiant Laiko, along with four of his fiercest warriors, to attack the demons and liberate the girls. They agreed, and visited the shrines of Hatsima, Sumiyoshi, and Kumano to enlist these gods' assistance. Joined by Laiko's chief retainer, Yasumasa, they concealed their armor and weapons in backpacks, and, disguising themselves as Buddhist hermits, the warriors set out from Kyoto town. Laiko and his men encountered an old hermit with two companions, who were astonished to find Laiko and his men traversing such dangerous territory. The hermit invited the warriors into his cottage and entrusted them with flasks of poisoned sake to serve the demons. He also presented Laiko with a magical golden helmet that would conceal his identity as well as protect him. The hermit and his companions helped the warriors build a bridge across a large pond, beyond which the demon's lair lay, deep within precipitous, cloud-girt Mount Oyema. After crossing, the hermit and his companions led Raiko's group to a river that would lead them to the demon's palace, and then they revealed themselves to be the gods of the three shrines at which the warriors had prayed before vanishing. Laiko and his men next came upon a beautiful maiden, weeping as she washed a bloody kimono. She explained that she and many other young women had been abducted by the demon Shendoji and brought to his palace. Many had already been killed so that Doji and his followers might feast on their flesh and blood. She herself had only narrowly escaped death. She described Shendoji as the lord of the demons, very strong, with unusual powers. Then she led Laiko and his men, still disguised, to the palace gate, where Doji was informed of their arrival. Doji was delighted to receive these visitors, for male flesh was thick and tasty to eat, so he invited them to enter his palace. There they were received by the frightening figure of a fat man nearly 43 meters tall. Doji cordially offered the warriors a large pot of sake, which they realized was actually human blood. They were also served a plate of sashimi, made from human flesh. Laiko then offered Dendoji the poison sake that he had received from the hermit. Doji drank three times from the cup and passed it on to the other demons. After several more rounds, Doji became drowsy, so he retired to bed. Laiko and his men then served more of the poison sake to the other demons, who likewise fell asleep. Then, two of the captive girls led Laiko to the ogre's bedchamber, situated in a tall tower, where shape-shifting Doji now was only six meters tall, with thick hair covering his entire body like a wild beast. As they pondered how best to dispatch him, the three gods reappeared and advised Laiko to cut off Doji's head. As Laiko did so, poison continued to spew from the severed head, which would have bitten him had the golden helmet not protected him. The warriors then slew all but two of Doji's demon followers and freed 34 captive maidens. The two demons were bound as captives and taken along with the heads of Doji and his slain followers back to Kyoto. 
whereupon the demon's palace vanished into thin air. Lyco and his followers triumphantly entered Kyoto, where the maidens were restored to their grateful families. Our third tale recounts the childhood of another member of the Minamoto clan. Ushiwaka was the childhood name of the greatest Japanese warrior of all time, Minamoto no Yoshitsune, who lived in the late 12th century CE. After his father was slain by the rival Taira clan, young Ushiwaka was spared and sent to the Kurama temple in the mountains north of Kyoto to become a monk. Ushiwaka proved to be an excellent student, but the desire to restore the reputation of his family and avenge his father's death at the hands of the Taira simmered within. While living at Kurama, he discovered that the temple was situated near the home of the legendary Tengu, bird-like goblins who could disguise themselves as humans, dressed as ascetic mountain monks. The Tengu were masters of combat arts, especially swordsmanship and the use of the desen or war fan. The great Tengu himself, impressed by the lad's courage and resolve, determined secretly to train him in the Tengu's martial arts. In this way, Oshiwaka acquired supernatural abilities to run and jump far beyond human limits. In this scroll, we see young Oshiwaka at play in the mountains at Korama, climbing a flowering cherry tree. During his explorations, he encounters a group of mountain hermits, and next we see him seated on a rock, conversing with them. The monks reveal themselves to be Tengu. In the next scene, they visit Ushiwaka to train him in their secret ways. The great Tengu, robed in orange, appears in human disguise. At the bottom right, however, we see two Tengu in their natural form. Next, the Tengu display their martial skill in leaping, and in the final scene, Ushiwaka bids farewell to the great Tengu. Soon after, Ushiwaka left Kurama Temple and was sheltered by Fujiwara no Hidehira until he reached manhood and assumed the name Yoshitsune. Then he embarked on various exploits, such as defeating the huge, fearless warrior monk Benkei on the Gojo Bridge in Kyoto. So impressed was Benkei that he became Yoshitsune's loyal retainer, and the two embarked on numerous adventures, including invading hell to fight the famous warriors there. The tale of Benkei and Yoshitsune's invasion of hell are the subject of two other Nara'ohan in the Chester Beattie collection. The three tales that I've recounted share the common theme of suppression of chaos and restoration of order due to the valor and courage of great heroes. They showcase the gay, or arts, of warriors who are assisted by gods and otherworldly beings. The monsters they encounter often inhabit fantastic worlds, Shtendoji deep within a mountain, the giant centipede terrorizing the underwater domain of a dragon king. Such heroic exploits, however exaggerated, also enhance the renown of two prominent Japanese families, the Fujiwara and Minamoto clans. Their survival and the embellishment of such tales over many centuries attest to the continuous attraction of tales of the supernatural in Japan, with which many Irish persons may also be familiar thanks to the writings of Lefkadi O'Hearn. I do hope that you will visit the Chester Beatty soon to view some of our Japanese scrolls in person, as well as the many other wonderful items from our collection currently on display.